Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we actually have a first. We're gonna be repairing this Atari 800. I've never actually shown an Atari 800 on the channel, well, other than a couple unboxings on mail call episodes, but never a repair. So today is time to break that bad habit and work on an Atari 8-bit machine. So without further ado, let's get right to it. It's a really, really nice looking machine. I gotta admit, this machine along with the 400, which was the cheaper, lower cost counterpart to this, came out in 1979. So a number of years before the Commodore 64, which I think is around the very end of 1982. These machines also came out before the VIC-20 even. So they really did beat Commodore to the punch with a color home 8-bit computer. Now, as far as consumer-oriented 8-bit computers, obviously the Apple II was already out. Well, I mean, and the PET and the TRS-80, but if we're talking about ones that had sort of sound and color, well, the Apple II was a competitor. But unlike the Apple II, the Atari 800 and the 400 Twin really have very capable color graphics, multi-channel sound output as well. While it doesn't have expansion slots as the Apple II does, it's a very expandable system. It's really quite an impressive machine, I have to say. Now, from a build quality, this thing is built really, really well. And I think it was shown in the price. It was pretty expensive of a machine. And I think Commodore was uh, setting out to undercut Atari with this machine. When we take a look inside, we'll see a little bit about how well this machine is built. But even from the outside, the case is really thick and sturdy. The keyboard feels very nice to type on, at least this particular one. Aesthetically, I think it looks pretty cool. We have four joystick ports on the front. On the side of the machine here, we have the video audio output, and it uses a DIN connector, but it's different than the Commodore 64. And this may be the very first machine ever that I'm aware of that has Luma Chroma video output. So it's the equivalent of S-Video for that, that really sharp image that the later Commodore 64s ended up adding as well. But Atari was doing it here in 1979. This multi-pin connector here is the expansion connector, and I think it's called SIO, Serial I.O. Now, I apologize in advance to all the Atari fans, I really don't know a whole lot about the Atari 8-bit um, line. So I'll surely make mistakes as I go through this repair, so please just bear with me. So anyways, back to this SIO, or Serial I.O. port. It's very much like Commodore's IEC port, and it allows you to daisy chain external peripherals. Modems, cassette drives use this as well, as did the floppy drives. And unlike the IEC port on the Commodore, this was designed for pretty high-speed operation right from the get-go. So disk drive performance on the Atari is far, far better than a non-fast loader equipped C64. We have a slider switch here, which is just a channel selector. I think it's two and three for the RF output. We have a power switch and then a 2.1 millimeter barrel power input. Now it's AC on this particular machine. I think it uses nine volts AC. And that's because there's an internal power supply in here to generate the various voltage rails that are needed. On the back of the machine, there is a fixed RF cable. Now this is very much like the 2600 before it. Why is this permanently attached when all the other connections on the side of the machine and the front of the machine are removable. This seems really silly, and I have to admit, when I take this computer apart, I'm gonna be removing this cable entirely, or if there's room inside, I'm just gonna tuck this away in there. I'm never gonna use the RF, and I find this wire hanging out the back is just ridiculous. And on the bottom, we have a couple labels here. I'm not sure what these two accepted stickers are. This one says uh, August 17th, 1985, and this one was used as a little bit of a warranty sticker, and someone obviously has been inside this machine. Looking at the Atari label itself though, Atari 800, Number 063, maybe that's the plant number. And then uh, I guess this is a serial number here. So if anyone recognizes where the sequence or what factory this was made in, uh, definitely put a comment down below. We'll look inside to look at the chips to see when they were actually made. So that'll give us an idea of the time period. Now looking at the keyboard here, it's got a pretty decent layout like the 64 and pretty much all machines at the time. You know, they didn't really have a standard. So things are a little strange. What you would think is a normal delete key is actually a break key with the delete key being next to it, and possibly an even worse mood than on the 64, the arrow keys are actually alternative functions on 
uh, these keys here and I think you need to push control to hit them or something. I'm not 100% sure on that, but yeah, up, down, up here, and then left and right on the second row below. Also a little bit strange, the caps lock is on the same row as the ASDF and the enter key or return is on the row above where it normally is on the QWERTY row. This would normally be like the backslash on a standard keyboard. So when you're initially trying to use this computer, just the fact that the enter key is up here is, it kind of throws you for a loop. And then the break key is in the spot where you should be pushing the delete key. In a very 70s fashion here, we have these buttons as well. So this bottom one here is a fixed button that doesn't actually push. That is the power LED. We have a start, a select, an option, and then a system reset button. And what's cool is the reset button, it's sort of recessed in these little, um, I don't know, plastic things here. So if you bump the keyboard like that, you're not gonna push the reset key. You have to push that down with your finger. I think overall the aesthetics of the machine and the keyboard and everything about this thing just, it just screams late seventies and I love it. I absolutely love it. But wait, there's a little bit more coolness about this machine. Up here on the top above the numbers, it says pull down. And when you do that, this actually has this flip up latch here, flip up lid, so to speak. And inside here you have cartridge ports. So we have two cartridge slots, left cartridge, right cartridge in this one here is the basic cartridge. So without this, the computer doesn't have basic. I'm not sure if Atari ever released replacement or updated basic cartridges, or maybe third parties did for this thing, but at least on these early machines, it was easily swappable. Now on later Ataris, I know they actually integrated the basic onto the motherboard and there was, there was no way to replace it. One thing though, when we have this cover open, take a look at this die cast metal thing inside here. It's really substantial looking and it goes all the way down to the cartridge slot, which looks a little bit like what you'd see on a 2600. But I'm pretty sure that this chunky metal here had to have been expensive to make. And clearly if you've ever seen inside a Commodore 64 or VIC-20, which of course you have if you watch my channel, there is nothing like this in those. There's actually a little bit more we can do without taking the entire computer apart when it comes to accessing what's inside. Now, once you pop the lid open, there are two screws right here and here, and I've already taken these out because I've already been poking around a little bit because I've never actually poked around this machine at all. So I had to kind of figure out how things worked, but with those screws out, then this I think comes off this whole like plastic piece. There we go. And take a look at that. We actually have four expansion slots in this machine and look at this metal. This all continues under there. Like that's just amazing. So I'm operating completely from memory, but I think what these are are RAM boards, and I think this front one is a ROM board. And indeed, this rather nice looking card I just pulled out, which is in really nice shape, does actually have four 116 DRAMs on here. I think it's pretty funny that what looks like a serial number here is kind of only half stuck on, and there's a little bit of a that sticky tape here. I don't know what the deal is with that. Maybe you peel that off and you're supposed to stick this underneath the machine to, to show the serial number of this card. I don't know. Anyhow, these chips seem to have date codes from very early 1982. Well, actually, no, this one here is from the 31st week of 1982. And actually the DRAM chips here are from the 41st week of 1982. The thing is, this machine might have been bought with a lesser amount of memory and these added later. Although I think I read that early on the 800 came out with say only 16K of RAM, but later they were all sold fully maxed out with 48K, which is three of these boards installed. We'll just quickly take a look at the other ones. Look, it's got the same thing going on with that sticker. And yes, it's the 42nd week of 1982. It is odd that they have a different color PCB here. The one on my right hand is a little more green, darker kind of greeny blue. Either way, they're both 16K RAM boards and they seem about the same vintage. I find this a little unusual. Look at this trace here, zigzagging back and forth. I wonder what the deal is with that. I couldn't have possibly <laughs> done anything for timing. You see stuff like this nowadays when you're having matched length traces, but that matters for differential pairs on like very high speed devices. Not a computer like this, which I think runs at like 1.7 megahertz or something thereabouts. All right, let's check out this, uh, the last board in here and look, it's that darker color PCB again. Look, someone did tear off uh, that sticker or it's floating around inside. And these RAM chips say 45th week of 1982. So this is slightly younger than all the other boards. And there's a look down into the machine. You see those three slots and all that plastic and metal and everything. Like I said, again, very nicely built. 
All right, and then the last one, this looks like ROM chips, but we have 1982 dates here on these ROM chips as well. Okay, let me repopulate these cards so we can take a look at what this machine is doing. Because as I said, this was a repair because there's something wrong with this thing. So let's see. And I, I'm noticing here actually that you can put these cards in either direction, I think. Yeah, they seem symmetrical and that would be bad obviously because I think that would cause damage. I also find it a little bit strange that while these cards are in here, they just sort of wobble around in the slots. Is it possible that the lid somehow holds them down? But I mean, there doesn't seem like there is anything on here. Maybe it just pushes down onto the cards. I don't know. There's these little notches on the top here. What I think is really cool about this setup is expanding your RAM on the Atari 800 is clearly something that a regular consumer could do. And it's low risk, I guess, other than plugging the cards in backwards, because it's very easy to get this cover off and just stick these cards in. In addition, did you notice that all of the RAM chips were socketed? So RAM diagnostics should be pretty easy, especially because you can just pull cards out while you're doing RAM tests, whatever those RAM tests are. And on that ROM board, these were also socketed as well. So if you had to do, uh, say, a, a ROM replacement, that would be doable as well. Or they could just send you an entire new ROM board, potentially. All right, for reattachment, looks like this metal cover notches in right there and actually slots in here. So that's a really good fit. And look, it just sort of clips down there and it doesn't move around at all. So even without those screws in there, um, this is not really gonna fall out very easily, especially if you have that lid closed. All right, so obviously we're not gonna be using my Commodore 64 power supply. What I have here on the bench is this Databyte power supply. It's uh, nine volts AC output, 42 watts. I have no idea if this was the actual Atari factory power supply, but I got this machine and an Atari disk drive, like an 810 and they both use the same power supply. So I have two of these, which I've labeled Atari 800 or 810 right there. As I had mentioned before, just has a normal 2.1 millimeter barrel jack. So that's all pretty standard. If you've lost your power supply and you have one of these, you just need a beefy nine volt power supply and that's all you really need to worry about. No polarity, obviously, because it's AC. All right, for connecting to the retro tank, I've gone ahead, let's see if it focuses, I made this little pigtail. It's a DIN there and it goes to Luma, Chroma and Audio. Now there's one extra pin on here, so it's possible that there's also composite video on that DIN jack, although I'm not totally sure. And I made this a while ago because I've had this computer for multiple years now and I tested it out with this, figured out it wasn't working and I never did more. So these RCA jacks go to the retro tank, which you see flashing periodically. That one goes to my speaker up there and we're ready to turn this on. There it is. We have a ready prompt. The image looks amazing. It's really sharp. It's really clear. No interference or anything like that. But the problem with this machine appears right now when you first power it on. When I try to type anything on the keyboard, nobody's home. No key does anything at all except for system reset. It actually resets the machine. So this is the problem that I want to troubleshoot now. Perhaps this keyboard has bad key switches, they're dirty, or there's a membrane underneath that's not working. I've never been inside an 800. I know nothing about how the keyboard even works. Is it connected to the motherboard? I mean, I think so because the reset button works, but maybe that signal is carried over a separate set of wires to a different place on the motherboard. Perhaps on the motherboard, there's a problem with one of the ICs that reads the keyboard. What I wanna do before I open this up is I want to test some software on this machine. Now, remember how I talked about the SIO port on the side of this thing being for disk drives and whatnot? It's a very standard five volt TTL serial signal. So this right here is an old Android phone. It's like a Motorola G, Moto G, I think. And this is something I made quite a long time ago for testing this exact thing. What you see here is a 3D printed SIO connector that plugs into that serial port. And I stole the pins that are in here off of an old AT power supply, if I recall. Obviously, if I had a regular spare SIO cable, I could have cut that and just made that. But uh, either way, it goes into this, which is a TTL serial board that plugs into USB. This is pretty standard stuff. Got this from China for like a dollar or whatever ages ago. I use these all the time for programming microcontrollers and stuff like that. Has a mini USB that goes to what is a USB to a micro USB on the go cable. And the reason for that is of course I can plug this contraption into this Android phone here and with some software on here, this can emulate disk drives. And even with no working keyboard, that doesn't mean that this machine won't work 
And that is simply because it actually supports auto booting, which is something the Commodore does not support, not until the Commodore 128. So if I wake up the Moto G here and I plug this cable into it, like so, it's actually gonna pop up with the program that's on here called Aspect or A-S-P-E-Q-T. And I actually have uh, Pac-Man loaded right there, but that's all it takes. This is now ready to go to emulate a disk drive. If I turn on the computer, that beeping is actually it loading the software. So this machine is actually working. So normally it loads basic from the ROM, it's very quick. And look, there it is, Pac-Man, it just loaded. So it says, press select for two player game. If I push select, hey, that is actually working. Look at that. And then it says, press option to change difficulty. And look, the fruit is actually changing as well. So that is interesting. And then press start to play game. Well, I'm gonna plug in my modified NES gamepad here, which has a regular Atari slash Commodore port on there. Let's plug that into this front joystick port here. And we'll hit start to play game. Oh, the start button on the keyboard works. And this machine is clearly working because I'm able to play Pac-Man. Sound is working. Graphics is working. Now, as much as I love playing with a gamepad, I must say that Pac-Man really is better with a proper joystick. Just maybe that feels a little bit more authentic. I don't know. Look at that, I actually finished the level without dying. Amazing. Oh, look at the little uh, cutscene here. That's kind of cool. All right, seems like the computer is working quite well. We know the joystick port works, SIO port works. These buttons on the side of the keyboard work, so we'll have to look at how those are connected. And it just seems like all the keys on the, on the rain part of the keyboard don't work. All right, so I'm gonna turn off the computer here and I think it's time to open this thing up, take a look on the inside. All right, I still have this top cover somewhat disconnected, so I'm just gonna remove that while we take the bottom off, or at least I attempt. I don't think there's any screws on the top side at all. I think everything is on the bottom. I don't even think there's even a screw in this middle one. Someone never reinstalled that one. All right, I don't know what I'm doing here. So does the top come off here? I flipped it back over. I think maybe the bottom comes off. Aha, there we go. Okay, check it out. <laughs> this metal cover, it's like super solid. All that die cast metal that we saw on the top all extends to the bottom here. So the motherboard clearly is underneath most of this cover. It's RF shielding, a really substantial type of RF shielding. Some of the motherboard sticks through here. Nope, uh, maybe, yep. I think some of the motherboard sticks out and this is like for the IO connections to that board, whatever it is, and also the main joystick ports. And there's a speaker in this machine. I thought I heard it click when I turned on the computer, but it's weird because I don't think I heard the Pac-Man music coming out of it. And the speaker is just sort of sitting there, but all right, obviously it's held in by the case. We see here the RF cable and you notice there's tons of room inside this computer over here. So I can um, just kind of unwind this once I get this apart and leave this cable inside the case. I don't have to cut it or anything. All right, let's keep digging in here. I'm gonna remove this very chonky RF shield here. Now I had always read about the Atari 800 and I think the 400 having this very substantial shielding. And it was around this time in the late 70s that the FCC in the US started kind of cracking down on uh, these computer manufacturers like, you know, Apple with their original one and their early Vic 20s and the TRC and that stuff during the late 70s really had no RF shielding at all. So emissions, you know, could have been problematic for interfering with radios and TVs and stuff that were nearby. So with this machine made by Atari, I think they were owned by Warner Media at the time, which was like a TV studio. And they obviously had a relationship with the FCC. So unlike with Apple, I think that they had to make sure that they, they were not skirting these new FCC part C, part B, whatever the rules were at the time. Hence all this very crazy shielding. And you have to imagine that back then, 
maybe the testing techniques for testing for our missions weren't that sophisticated. So they didn't really know what to do other than just like throw everything with the kitchen sink at it. And this is what the engineers came up with, this, this very substantial shielding. I mean, I've already removed, uh, there's gonna be eight screws. I'm not even sure that's, that's all of them. Well, I'm just gonna keep taking screws out. All right, so this thing seems to be somewhat loose. Although, I don't know, not sure here. Okay, well, there is one thing I am noticing while I'm taking this out, and it's that the keyboard under here is connected to this board, but the buttons on the side, the orange buttons, the LED, the reset, are connected to this board here. So they are two separate things entirely. I think we're there, almost. I'm gonna take the speaker off. And the keyboard connection, which is right here, goes to this PCB where the joystick ports are. And is this even making a good connection? Yeah, I think it's on there properly. Looks like it's sort of a bent type of connection. It's hard to tell what's happening here until we get this flipped over. The keyboard connection is extremely stuck on here. It's coming off, there it is. Okay, I think I have freed the computer. It's unbelievably heavy. And let's put that down and move this keyboard. Okay, so there it is. Uh, this is what I was talking about here. So there's the uh, these reset buttons, option start. They go on this little PCB over on the side here. Keyboard connection is here. So we'll be able to give this thing a little test because we first need to see if these keys are making contact. Now check it out, it's a Mitsumi keyboard. Same manufacturer is on the 64. So I'm presuming if we take this PCB off with all these little tiny screws, it'll have a very similar setup to the 64 with those little plungers or the little contacts that contact the PCB. And certainly on the Commodore PET, um, I've had more than one PET through the basement here, none of the keys worked at all, and it was all entirely a problem in here. So I'm kind of thinking that's almost certainly what's gonna be the case here. All right, and there, <laughs> there is the Atari 800 on the inside. <laughs> Just look at this. Look at this insanity here. It is so overbuilt. It's amazing, just simply amazing. So luckily for the RF cable here, it just simply connects to this sideboard right here with this internal RF RCA cable because there's the RF modulator. What we have here is the bridge rectifier with discrete diodes. We have a couple capacitors here to create the DC. And then on this heat sink here, we have some voltage regulators. It feels like there's perhaps one back there, which I can't easily see, although maybe not. Uh, there's definitely one right here. And right here, there's a little kind of micro switch of some kind. When I push that down, it does something. I have to kind of wonder if it's something to do with this top cover. Perhaps this pushes down on that switch. All right, and here it is right here. It's this little black plunger. It does move, and that is pushed down when you have this closed. So obviously if you open this up, maybe it shuts off the computer, maybe it resets it or something like that or keeps it in reset. So when you plug a cartridge in, it won't potentially damage anything. Uh, or maybe when you close the lid, it resets the computer or something like that. But very high quality feeling switch. This whole computer just seems to be really, really well constructed. We have two PCBs in here, this huge die cast cage, this complicated case assembly. Atari just was not messing around with this machine. There is quite a bit of dust on this shield in here, and I know it obviously doesn't really mean anything, but I'm just gonna clean that dust off. I'm gonna remove this RF cable here. Take a look at this wire management back here, strain relief for this RF cable. That is so chunky and substantial. But there it is, there's the RF cable for the uh, 800. So if you want to remove it, easy peasy, just take it apart, take it off there, cut these uh, zip ties off, and you can just stash it inside the case when you put it back together. All right, I am noticing here that this top cover is now disconnected from the motherboard. So what I'm gonna do is just turn this around here. I think I need to remove these expansion cards. And this should allow us access to the motherboard underneath. Maybe. Okay, I see what's going on. This is still screwed together on the side right here. And with those screws out, I should be able to 
pull this off the board to board interconnect here. There we go. And now I think this should lift off. There it is. <laughs> I mean, just look at this. Oh, I'm sorry. I know I've talked about this a lot, but this is just funny to see in person. I'm, all right, and we get our first glimpse at this machine. So one thing I'm noticing is there's another card back here. Look at that. It's just hidden out of view in um, behind the other slots. So this one here says ATMC, and I assume this is the brains of the operation. There's the 6502 processor. And then we have an Atari branded chip from 1979 here. Looks like it's CO14805-22. And then we have the CO12296 D03. A little bit of TTL logic. We have potentiometer here of some kind. And then when we look at the motherboard, probably underneath here, which is clipped on, I don't feel like unclipping it. It just has all the slots in the cartridge slots. We have a 6520 right here. So this would be the IO controller. Right here is a 9042. I don't even know what that is, a CO12294-19. So that's some kind of a custom Atari chip. All right, actually this socketed chip here is the Pokey chip, which stands for Pot Keyboard Integrated Circuit, which is the digital IO chip designed for the 8-bit family of computers. And it's also found in Atari arcade machines. It samples the potentiometer, such as the paddles, scans the matrices of switches for a computer keyboard, as well as the sound generation. Has four voices of distinctive square wave sound, either as clear tones or a modified number of distortion settings. All right, so that implies that the 6520 here probably only is handling the joysticks and potentially some of the I.O. from this board here, like these uh, front panel or these keyboard buttons here, maybe that switch, stuff like that. So as far as the keyboard not working, let's hope that it's not the Pokey that's the problem because I don't have a replacement Pokey on hand, although I'm sure it's a, a sort of obtainable chip. I mean, I don't really know if it's hard to find or whatever but uh, it also is in a socket. It looks really clean in here. I don't see corrosion. So I'm not gonna jump to any conclusions that the problem is corrosion in here. I think what I'm gonna do for testing is I'm gonna reinstall these boards here. Remember, these all go with the chips facing away. Oh, I'm also noticing on the back of the motherboard PCB, it looks like an expansion header. There it is right there. Maybe Atari thought about designing some kind of a rear expansion thing that gave more cards or something like that. I want to test to see if the keyboard routine or scanning is working if we go right off the keyboard connector here, and that will completely validate for me that it's just the keyboard that's dirty. I'm gonna plug the basic cartridge in, and I will need something to prop up under this. How about this roll of tape here? Is that gonna be the right height? Oh yeah, that totally works. There we go. And let's see if this thing is still working. No. What did I do wrong here? Oh, this button needs to be pushed, I think. It kind of confirms my hunch that this little micro switch here cuts power to the entire system. Okay, a little tape over there. Now let's see what happens. There we go. We got the ready prompt. So I'm just gonna do a quick Google for Atari 800 keyboard matrix. And here it is, Atari 800 XL. I don't know if that's the same thing. And so as you can see in this matrix, when you push the M, it shorts together pin seven and pin 12, and that's what makes the computer actually register that key press. Aha, take a look at this. So there's the pokey, and it doesn't read the keyboard directly. It goes through these CD4051s here, which is actually potentially a good thing. These are the two ICs right there. They are socketed. That means that if something bad were to happen on the input here, then those ICs would probably go first before the pokey does, and those are easily replaced. For testing, I'm just gonna clip this clip lead onto pin one here, which on the schematic is right there. And now I can uh, just short to these pins over here and we should start seeing key presses. All right, we have the ready prompt. I'm just gonna clip this onto a little screwdriver here so I can poke uh, let's see, 14, 15, 16, 17. So this is 14. And look, I'm getting a key press. Uh, it's the other one. So yeah, this is kind of showing us, there's the nine. And there is the zero that I was expecting. So that tells us right off the bat that we have no problem with the circuitry that's scanning the keyboard. And the problem 
simply lies in the keyboard itself. So I gotta say that's pretty pleasing because uh, that means that this Atari here is fully operational, at least from the circuitry standpoint. And well, it's from, what does it say? 1982 is what we see on these ICs here. That is a nice, reliable machine. Clearly, whoever is manufacturing these ICs, like this is a National Semiconductor that made the Pokey, was a better fab than Moss with their flaky, flaky chips. And on that bombshell, I'm gonna end this video here. I'm really happy to know that the Pokey inside the 800 is working fine, and really the problem lies completely with the keyboard here. So I'll have to be attacking that in the next video, which I'm not really looking forward to because fixing mechanical problems in keyboards can sometimes be really tricky. As you can see here on the bench, there is lots more Atari 8-bit stuff to come in the future. Most of this stuff, I don't even know if it works, except for the 800XL that sits on the top here. This is one that I've had for quite a long time. I got this before I was really making videos and it never needed any repairs. It just worked and it's running ball blazer right here. But this other stuff on the other hand, I have a feeling there's gonna be some good troubleshooting videos coming out of that stuff. So that's gonna be it for this video. As you can see here, I'm wearing an Adrian's Digital Basement t-shirt. If you'd like to order one, I have them in various colors and men's and women cuts. There's a link in the description below to my merch store. Next up, I'd like to thank my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. They knew about the fact I was repairing this Atari, well, not this Atari, this Atari, before the video was published and have made some good recommendations for me to try some games, including Ball Blazer, which was one of them. So if you'd like to become a patron and get early access videos and whatnot, uh, there's a description and link below as well. Thumbs up this video if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't, comment down below all the usual YouTube stuff, subscribe, second channel, etc., etc. And that is going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.